We've been talking about the theory of evolution and talking about the evidence that you can use to substantiate the theory of evolution. And one of my favorite pieces of evidence is modern biological research based on DNA research. Biotechnology has opened the doors of analysis of evolutionary record and actually made the argument for evolution almost irrefutable. It's almost as silly as saying that we are not orbiting around the sun, but the other way around. You sound like those uh, people from the Middle Ages, which uh, were defending an ignorant point of view based on, on dogma, instead of looking at the evidence that's in front of your eyes. And it's like, no, 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 I don't want to hear it, I don't want to hear it, I don't want to hear it, kind of thing. And you become close-minded to something that's not necessarily going to make you less of a good person just by listening to the way that life works. And actually understanding the beauty about life, for whatever reason it's here, actually it's diminishing life and everything you think about life, including if you think it's um, some sort of design thing, uh, which could be the case. Uh, I'm not arguing against it at this video at least, but if you actually think about it, you're going to think and see that the beauty of life is actually, this is part of it. And if you take this away from life, you're going to see it take away from the greatness of life. And take away from from all the marvelousness or, or the beauty, even the miracle that life is in itself, regardless of what you want to believe that this was an accident or if it was an actual design miracle, it is miraculous. And not studying like this will actually take away from your experience of, of understanding life. And so the, the apex of current study in biology is DNA research to prove evolution. Now... What we do with DNA research is a lot of things. For example, and I, this slide is not showing you all of that, but and I do this when I do biotechnology lecture series, but we have a lot of DNA research that shows homology between DNA sequences. In other words, you can actually, and this is what this picture is showing you on the top here, is that when you analyze the gene sequences in different kinds of bird families, for example, this is what they're doing in this picture, you can actually compare how many genes the families have in common and compare the number of mutations that actually existed between one family and another. And then you're going to have different possibility to try to arrange the, the, the bird families. Now, when you look at the birds morphologically, all the class of birds that exist, it becomes very challenging to kind of put them taxonomically. And bird taxonomy has been one of the greatest challenges of the 21st century to try to uh, uh, figure out a way that actually makes logistical sense on, on the evolutionary record. And it wasn't until we started doing DNA analysis and protein sequence analysis and looking at the actual molecular homology, or in other words, how similar DNA-wise these species are, and that we actually figured out uh, where to place them. And so you see these are three different versions of how to arrange through the tree of life for some of the families of birds. But what you're going to end up doing is you're going to choose the one that's most parsimonious or the simplest possible explanation or the one that has most fits the evidence that you have from both morphological and DNA research. And it, without getting into detail uh, on this right now because it's more part of the biotechnology lecture series and the taxonomy series, I wanted to point out that you can use DNA to actually quantify the similarity between different animals. Now I wanted to also point out that just like you can have homologous structures, analogous structures, vestigial structures, and mosaic structures at the anatomy or morphological level, you can also have the same kind of things happening at the molecular level. So for example, you can have similarities in DNA or protein sequences between animals which are similar to each other because they share common ancestors. That's homologous molecular structures. You can have similarities between animals which do not share common ancestors since the development of a feature, but they have similar proteins with similar domains because they were under the same kinds of pressures. That's analogous uh, molecular structures. You can have DNA sequences which are no longer functional or maybe mutated to the point that they can no longer produce an actual protein, but they're remnants of sequences that used to be functional in our forefathers or species that came before us. So this is damaged DNA that's still in the DNA code, no longer functional, but sitting there as a remnant of a DNA that used to be functional. So you have also what we call vestigial DNA structures. And much of the human DNA is actually like that.
and we can use those similarity sequences to compare us to our ancestor species. You also have mosaic DNA structures. For example, pieces of DNA that evolve for a purpose but end up being used for another. For example, the immunoglobin gene, which does immuno immunology or antibodies against all kinds of different diseases that evade our body, they were developed for a purpose, but they actually can be used for multiple purposes in the body. And you see how that's actually an example of, of, this, of mosaic structures. You evolve for one reason, but you, you, the body is using the same kind of protein in many different ways, almost plate tropically. Remember what we talked about plate in genetics, one gene doing multiple jobs? And the same kind of thing here. So then that means that scientists can analyze the similarity in the DNA code to actually, just like you would in morphological evidence, to see how similar animals are, either because they share common ancestors or because they share common uh, uh, environments or because they can look at the evidence of our ancestors through the stuff that we have left over from their ancestors or they can look at the changes that have happened to structures that evolve for one purpose and an hour serve for another. And that can teach us a lot about the evolutionary purpose of life and the evolutionary record of life. And that's why DNA research is at the fore end of understanding of, of evolutionary record because just like an example I gave you with the birds, looking at DNA research, you can make a more clear picture of the similarities between the animals that you can look at if you just did it morphologically. In fact, sometimes a morphological tree of life looks nothing like the DNA tree of life because the DNA tree of life shows you a better picture of what the similarity of between the animals truly is like. Remember, of course, that sometimes you have DNA that's not expressed. And so looking at the DNA is better than looking at the phenotype because you look at the source of the phenotype, basically. To give an example of that, let's say, for example, you have a species that has a gene A and another species that also have a similar gene. And you compare these genes between the two species and you see that most of the genes are 98% similar. And you compare another set, and you say species A and C, for example, and you say they're only about 30% similar. And you compare species A and D, and you say, well, these species are only about 20% similar. And so if you wanted to construct a tree of life for those species, you can do something like this. What would be the most logical way to arrange it? Would you put A close to B, and then split that and put C like that? Would that be a tree of life? Uh, or and then maybe split that and put a D over here. Could that be a tree of life? Or would you have to put a more a lot of, another way? Put A and B over here, and then you split that branch a little bit more into into D over here, and then that branch splits into C over here. What's the most parsimonious or easiest interpretation of that data? A and B are close together, so they have to be branched recently. And so that makes sense, but that was there as well. Now, who's branched more recently, A and C or A and D? A and C shared 30%, while A and D share only 20%, which means A is closest to, to C than it is to D, which means this tree of life over there, it makes more sense, right? And that's how tr scientists use DNA research to construct pe uh, actual um, branches or taxonomy branches of the tree of life. Now, the interesting thing about DNA research is that mutations, like we learn about, happen a specific way. We know how good the proteins, which are um, mismatch repair proteins, are like. And we can actually use DNA to figure out how good the, the, the proteins are, are like. So if you look at that and you realize that the DNA accumulates mutations at a certain rate, that means that you can tell how, how long it took for the DNA to change a certain amount. So, for example, let's say you have an original piece of DNA, right? So you have this original piece of DNA. And let's say that you get another animal that has a similar piece of DNA, and except that it, it has a few changes to that piece, a few uh, mutations of sorts, whatever. And, but overall, it's going to be about 70% the same as the species A was. Okay, now since you know the rate of mutation or you know how often a DNA change can actually take place based on the mismatch repairs, based on everything, all the body mechanisms which lead to mutations, 
you know how often mutations accumulate how long it takes for a certain number of mutations to accumulate you can get that number through fossil records you can get that number through actual dna analysis of different species and all kinds of things like that so if you actually calculate the rate of mutations and you can do that pretty accurately by looking at the kinds of proteins that they are in charge to take care of the mismatch repair you can actually create a code like this for example let's say you have about a hundred nucleotide substitutions in, in one given gene we know that it usually takes about 125 million years based on the rate of mutations that for that to happen so I if I know that the difference between A and B here which caused this 70 percent difference was at 125 nucleotide changes I can tell that these two branched apart from each other about 125 million years ago now that means that you can analyze gene sequences between different animals and compare how closely together these animals are and you use that like we did in the previous example to create a taxonomy tree of life like this but you can add a layer to that and see how different they actually are apply the mutation uh, rate to it and actually calculate how long ago that split in the tree of life most likely happened for example we can know that primates evolved from away from carnivores around a hundred million years ago but that we actually share common ancestor with birds almost 350 million years ago and that our ancestors with with kinds of bony fish we're all, all the way 45, 450 million years ago. So you can see, do, this is called molecular clocking. And you can use the rate of mutations, compare the sequence of DNA, create a, a tree of life, and then actually calculate the changes of, of how many base pair substitutions or deletions or whatever kinds of mutations you got. You know how long it takes for those mutations to happen. You, and then you calculate how long it took for this animal to branch from you. That is a phenomenal way to actually track the history of evolution. And as you can see, DNA research can do all of that for you. It can tell you uh, homology, analogy, vestigial structures, or mosaic structures at the molecular level. It can help you create taxonomy trees, and it can help you create a clock to time how long ago the evolutionary process takes place. That is how we can actually tell how far ago or how long ago different life forms evolved. And as you can see, there is a lot of evidence for evolution, including in actual molecular data.